Welcome. Um, as part of our overview of the appendicular skeleton, we are um, going to start with the scapula and the humerus uh, and take a look at each of these. We'll start with the scapula. I'm going to make this fairly quick, um, so you can always go back and rewatch it as many times as you need to. All right. Scapula has a lot of interesting structures, surface features on the bone. The ones that I would like students to know are this major feature right here, which if you reach around um, across your shoulder in the back and you feel what most people refer to as the shoulder blade, that's the scapular spine sometimes because the spine, the actual human spine, will be over here somewhere. People get confused when you talk about spines, but this one's the scapular spine. That's important because we call this dish shaped, what I call when I make a hand motion like a cup, this is a dish shaped feature called a fossa because it's above the spine, we call it the supraspinous fossa, right here. And beneath, or inferior to that spine, we have the infraspinous fossa, cup-shaped space right here. You may be asking yourself, why do I have to know all these silly features on a bone? Because if you learn these features really well, it will set you up to learn muscles really well later. The muscle that sits in this fossa is called the infraspinatus. And the one that sits in this fossa right here is the supraspinatus. So knowing these features on the bone will help you to remember exactly where those muscles are. If we go to the very end of the scapular spine, we see a structure. It's called the acromion or acromion process or acromial process. The root word of that, acro, means high. And when this is in the correct position with the surface of the anterior portion of the scapula against the, the posterior part of your rib cage. This sits up the highest of any of the structures on your appendicular skeleton. It meets with the clavicle here, um, and that joint, the acromioclavicular joint, um, is one, the highest area. So think of someone having acrophobia, fear of heights, or the acropolis, the highest point in the city of Athens where the um, ancient ruins are. Um, high, so this is a high point, acro. This process right here, which looks very similar from this dimension, this is from the lateral view. If we look at it, let's see, if we look at it this way, or this way, it looks a little bit like, here we go, the head of a bird. Okay, this is the coracoid process, often confused with the coronoid processes. The coracoid process, uh, coraco means crow, and so if you think of this as looking like a crow, but also think if you had a pet crow, where would your crow sit? Up on your shoulder, okay? So you can think of this as being the place where your crow would sit or your coracoid process. I don't encourage people to mispronounce things, but sometimes if it helps you to remember and you think crowacoid process to help you just get there, maybe that will help, okay? Now we're looking at the anterior surface of the scapula, which would be up against the back of the vertebral, or the rib cage, and this space right here is called the subscapular fossa. Again, it's a cup-shaped or depression area. And guess what we would call a muscle that sits right here? You guessed it, subscapularis. Okay. The last feature I want to point out is this lovely sort of oval, again, a fossa. Um, I learned it as the glenoid fossa. This is a hole that was drilled in here. There is no hole here naturally. This was drilled here on a uh, model, and we took it apart. And um, so we're looking at disarticulated parts. That fossa, which is about the size of a half dollar uh, or a dollar coin, um, is called the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity. More, some more modern terminology is to call it the glenoid cavity. Now, in that cavity will sit the head of the humerus. But you'll notice it doesn't make much of a socket in there. And so what you realize is um, while the shoulder joint is our most mobile and lets us move this joint in the most rain, greatest range of motion, it has also um, got the least amount of connection in the joint and so is the most prone to injury. And that's why we have lots of rotator cuff injuries. Most of the joint is going to be made of cartilage that's attached to the edge of this in a lip or labrum and a bunch of ligaments and tendons that hold this in place. So a quick look at the humerus when we look at the head. Okay. Um, Right next to the head will be another lump, and then just a little bit, and then a dip, and then another lump. Okay? The very large one that almost looks like a little head that's opposite this nice smooth round head of the humerus, okay? this one is called the greater tubercle. And the word tuber 
<clears throat> I would like you to think a tuber is a oval, lumpy growth. Think of a potato. Potatoes are referred to as tubers, and so I like to tell my students, you have little white potatoes all over your skeleton. If it's kind of oval and lumpy, if you can't think of anything else, call it a tuber, tubercle or a tuberosity, and you have a very good chance of maybe getting that right. So the greater ones here, the lesser one sits more anteriorly, and there's a kind of a slide in between. What I learned as a sulcus, the more um, the, the original Latin name, and we now call grooves. And because it's between this tuber and that tuber, we shall call it the intertubercular groove, okay, or sulcus. As we move down along the humerus to the um, distal end, we've just been looking at the proximal end. The distal end has a lovely condyle. I tell my students a condyle, if you make a fist and rotate it, it's like a smooth cylindrical surface um, at a hinge joint. But this one has some extra lumps in it, and this one right here is very round. It is going to eventually sit on the top of the golf tee, the golf tee bone, which is the radius. Okay, so that think of that as a golf ball. We call it the capitulum. Capit is another word for head. And in Latin, when we stretch out a word and make it long, the structure becomes tinier. So this is a capitulum. Some people say capitulum. Either one, as long as you can remember it and whatever helps you to remember it and spell it. And then this side actually looks like a pulley. And the Latin name for a pulley is a trochlea. Okay, a pulley is, uh, has a little dip in the middle, so you can put a rope through here, like on your tree fort, and haul that bucket of treats up to your tree fort from the ground. Okay? So trochlea and capitulum. The capitulum is going to be on the radial side, so we would say that's on the lateral side, and the trochlea is going to be on the ulnar side, that's the medial side. We have, because this is one condyle made with two special shaped parts to it, a medial and a lateral part to the same condyle. Just upon these, this condyle are two structures that stick out. A really big one on the medial side called the medial epicondyle. Epi means upon, so it is stuck upon the condyle. And then we have the lateral epicondyle, which doesn't stick out quite as well. You can palpate these on your own body through your own skin and feel those, as you can also feel this greater tubercle up here in your shoulder and your acromion process from your scapula. Most people can feel their coracoid process. They can palpate that right through their skins and skin and muscle themselves. Last thing is we have some fossae down here. We have the fossa that allows our elbow, our ulna, which we'll talk about in our next video, to come up and be able to close that joint, make it very a small angle there. If we didn't have a little dip right, right here, then this pointy coronoid process of the ulna wouldn't have any place to go. So if that, you know, if there was no dip right there, that's as far as you could bend your elbow. But because we have that coronoid fossa for that point to go in, you can bend your elbow much farther. Okay, the, on the other side, if we flip the humerus over, there's a big dip on here, and that's where the back side of the ulna the olecranon, or what you would call your elbow, will fit right in to that little um, fossa in there. Again, if we didn't have that dip for that big head to fit in, that's about as far as you could straighten your arm. And because we have that dip, you can, kind of, you can straighten that out all the way. Um, so I think that covers what we have on our list for the humerus and the scapula. Stay tuned for our radius ulna and carpals coming up. Thanks.